Good morning and welcome. In the name of God who gets us, who really gets us all, be welcome to worship this day. This is the second in our series of weird worship as we're all learning to live into and grow into new ways of being church together, ways that move us from being the gathered church to being the more connected church. If you're a guest with us today, we especially want to welcome you as all of us share together in worship online this day. We would ask that everyone worshiping with us go on to our website and click on the connect card so that we can have record of your being with us today. Uh, we are glad that you're here for worship and want to welcome you in Christ. We join now as we worship together. prayer that each of us have an opportunity to stay connected to God. So as we come now to this time of prayer, I invite you just to relax and be ready to experience the presence of God in your spirit. Let us pray. God of comfort, healing, and peace, as we continue our Lenten journey, we had no idea what we would have to give up during the season of Lent. We confess that we were unprepared to be your church in the midst of a pandemic. We were unprepared to give up our travel plans. We were unprepared to put the health of others above the health of ourselves. Forgive us, O oh God, for our selfishness. Healer of all, we know that Jesus Christ traveled through towns and villages, curing every disease and illness. At your command, the sick were made well. Come to your aid now, during, come to our aid now, during the global spread of coronavirus, COVID-19, that we may experience your healing love. Heal those who are sick. May they regain their strength and health through quality medical care. Heal us from our fear, which prevents nations from working together and neighbors from helping one another. Heal us from our pride, which can make us vulnerable to a disease that knows no borders. Whether we are home or abroad, surrounded by many people suffering from this illness are only a few. Lord God, stay with us as we endure and mourn persist and prepare. In place of our anxiety, give us your peace. And may we at First St. Charles continue to be a safe, welcoming, and wanting community for all persons, regardless of health, sexual identity, race, or gender. And now let us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So we want to know, as we continue to stay connected through prayers, how can we pray for you? You can send us your prayer request online through our website, firststcharlesumc.org. Please let us know how we can pray for you and how we can stay connected to you through prayer. 
We also have the opportunity to stay connected together through our practicing of generosity. We can be generous with our love and our support for our families, our friends, and our neighbors. We can be generous with our prayers. And we can be generous in supporting the ministries of First St. Charles. Through our giving, we support and stay connected to the church. Our gifts help us to maintain our online worships and to engage in online ministry. You can simply mail your checks to the church. We all can go online anytime and send and submit our offering online through our website. Thank you for your giving. Thank you for your generosity. And thank you for staying connected.
But I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me, that is, my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what is good, evil is close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched person that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the many reasons to adore the Bible is its absolute and unrelenting realism about us. It sees and it sings of the real beauty that can shine in us. And it knows and names all that is miserably wrong and deadly in us. If you were raised to think that that was to make you feel guilty, I'm sorry, you were misled. It's there to help make us honest and to keep us honest. For if we're deceived about ourselves, we have no hope. Our text today especially gets us. Paul is talking about a struggle, his struggle, and the struggle of us all. It's the struggle to have a life of integrity and faith. It's the Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in us. We know what is good and right and just and holy and pure. We want to do just that. Yes, let's do that. Easier said than done. Like a virus or a cancer in us, it's insipidly inside us and we end up doing just exactly the opposite. Back and forth comes the internal and eternal struggle of our souls. The consequences can't be denied. By ourselves, we're helpless. Back and forth, again and again, the struggle comes. Breakthrough gives way to backsliding. Spiritual progress is offset by spiritual defeat. For each mountaintop, there is the darkest and darkest 
of valleys. We don't have to look any further. The line between good and evil runs right through, cuts right through our very human heart. Today, we continue our Lenten series, Confronting Evil. It's a real look at real evil. Last week, we spoke of Satan suggesting that always evil takes on a human face. Today we take it a step further, quoting the philosophy of the great cartoon character Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us. We are our worst enemy. But take hope. There is redemption in Jesus Christ. This, in sum, is the message today. It starts with the clear confession of the Apostle Paul in verse 15. I do not understand my own actions. Don't we all want and need to be understood? In his book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, Stephen Covey argues that to be effective... We should seek first to understand before ever trying ourselves to be understood. In this, he's echoing that great prayer by St. Francis, which petitions, O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. True it is undoubtedly true. And who am I to argue with the likes of either Stephen Covey or St. Francis? But maybe it's also true that we do need to understand ourselves. It was a time of great evil in our world throughout the 1940s. The forces of fascism were killing millions. Here in America, there was a theologian whose insight charted a different course and whose influence provided a thoughtful guide to more than one president. His name was Reinhold Niebuhr. He was born just up the road from here in Wright City. While the sword of Niebuhr's thought swung relentlessly both right and left, striking both liberals and fundamentalists, he insisted that faith must ultimately deal with reality. Our human capacity, he said, for justice makes democracy possible. But our human inclination to injustice makes democracy necessary. Ultimately considered, Niebuhr said, evil is done not so much by evil people, but by good people who do not know themselves. I don't understand my own actions, Paul owns. While I could be tempted to fret about people who never reflect on their own internalized self, even that could be a dodge, a carefully habituated technique designed to evade and excuse me from an honest day's work of self-reflection. At the end of the day, aren't all of our motives mixed, all of our lives seen in a glass darkly, as Paul says to the Corinthians? It's hard enough in this world when we don't have others who understand us, who don't get us. Don't make it worse. Don't we make it worse when we don't get ourselves? That's the first movement in our text. The second movement comes when Paul cries out, verse 24, Wretched man that I am. Wretched. That's not a world word we overly use much. I doubt I've ever even spoken it before today. Even the spoken 
word out loud in a sentence. But isn't wretched a good word, or at least an accurate word? In the old German Teutonic, it meant an exile, a banished person, someone who would be miserable anywhere, exiled from being at peace with ourselves. And maybe when we hear it instead as a homonym, wretched, like an illness that we expel from our bodies, it really gets to the state of our sin-sick souls. This wretched word about us is inescapably dark. We whose essence is good are very badly bent. The reasons for this are left largely mysterious in Scripture, but the facts of it are relentlessly held up to us. We think crooked thoughts, dream crooked dreams, make crooked choices, do crooked deeds. We are caught in addiction and narcissisms. These aren't just little personal peccadillos, little times when we've screwed up or messed up. It's venom in our very veins. We are shot through, all of us, with this sickness. It touches all that we do and all that we are. The biblical words for it are sin and evil. And though the church has badly botched the truth of those words, used them in ways that are trivial, manipulative, and mean, the words stand for what is really wrong with us all, sin and evil. They name what is deadly in us, our hatefulness, our arrogance, our need to control, our destructive anxieties, our damaging passiveness, pettiness, self-pity, and what we're greedy for. And if we are that damaged on our own, then put us together in tribes, races, clans, posses, and political parties, companies, nations, or religions, and our capacity for evil can grow truly monstrous. According to Scripture, we are so far gone that even when we mean to do good, our sickness insinuates itself. Taking a sober look at this messy mix in our motives and actions, the prophet Isaiah laments, all our righteousness is like filthy rags. We're never purely doing good, which is to say, with Paul, there is no hope for us in our goodness. We have all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God. And that brings me to both a confession and the final movement of this message. I said that I don't ever recall using the word wretched in a sentence, but I have sung it or at least a form of it, more times than I can ever recall. So I suspect have you. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me, both preceding our sin and exceeding our hope. For redemption comes the gift of grace, both Amazing, life-changing, and world-changing grace. Who will rescue me from this body of sin and death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. God gives us this grace. The state of our wretched soul is so fixed and so deadly that even God can't wave it away but it bears into, but bears into it this awful death. 
That's what the mystery of atonement is telling. The utterness of our worth and the utterness of our sin and the utterness of love in the one who died, taking hold of them both. So we can have redemption from our sin. Being accepted, we may find new freedoms from certain old sins. We can get better. But never does it happen apart from fully facing what we are. Confessing it always and living into the honest humility of sinners who are being redeemed. As someone has rightly said, in Christ we move from a battle we cannot win to a battle we cannot lose. In the first century, if on a far-flung battlefield an emperor won a great victory, which secured his peace and established his authority. He would send heralds, the Greek word is peace and authority. Put simply, the gospel is an announcement, a declaration. The gospel is not advice to be followed. It is news, good news, about what has been done. So today, with trumpets blaring might we be sent out as heralds angloi angels to declare God's victory when we confess our sin and seek redemption for Christ we move from a battle we cannot win to a battle we cannot lose this is the movement to which We are all called. Go and tell it everywhere. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I am Lindsay Willard humble to serve as your director of outreach and marketing here at First St. Charles. And might we be sent out, even now, even this week. Friends, it has been a week, a week of uncertainty, a week of social distancing, and yet it's been a week where we have been the church. On Monday, Pastor Bart put out a call for all of us, a call to commit, a call for one, one, one. And this one, one, one call asked us to one, watch a worship service online each week, two, to call or do a video chat daily with one person from the church, and three, to share the worship service online with our friends, on our social networks, and still to invite people into our community of faith. So how have you been doing, friends? How has this week been? Have you been able to connect and stay connected? Today's invitation, this week's invitation, is the same from last week. Continue committing to the Nine one or the one 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 call, based on the nine one one call, like Pastor Bart mentioned on Monday in his video message. Commit to one one one, one one one, as we stay connected, and as we continue being sent out, and being the church. And now, as we offer benediction, blessing on this, our worship service together, may God in Christ bless you and keep you safe, 
secure and healthy. And if you aren't or feel alone or isolated, as we all keep our social distance, may the Lord's face shine upon you and be gracious unto you, giving you the grace to reach out, to use every means available to you, to stay connected with each other, more so now than ever before. And in this way, be church. You, we, can be the church. May the Lord's countenance be lifted upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, Amen.